Welcome to our program. Uh, my name is Mike Heithouse. I have the privilege to serve as the Dean of the College of Art, Sciences, and Education. And I'd like to welcome everybody to a very important teach-in that we have today on Red Tide. Uh, we're joined today from representatives from the city of Miami Beach, Miami-Dade County, local business owners, students, faculty, staff, and concerned citizens. And you know, while Red Tide is a very serious concern for our community and uh, communities around the state, um, it's good to see so many people here uh, ready to engage in a discussion on this topic because a lot of the decisions that we're gonna have to make as citizens and as leaders are really gonna help chart the future for our communities and for this state. So uh, once again, thank you for being here. Um, at this time, it is my great pleasure uh, to welcome FIU's fifth president to the podium, Mark B. Rosenberg. Uh, thank you very much, Dean. Thank you all for being here. I um, uh, want to thank in particular our, our, my colleagues and, and our, our faculty for uh, leaning in, professional staff for, for mounting uh, this gathering. So last week, uh, at the beginning of the week, probably very few of us were thinking about uh, this issue, it was a problem elsewhere, and um, you know we were focused on getting through uh, hurricane season. And now we find uh, days later that uh, red tide is not just a problem for the west coast of Florida, it's potentially a very serious problem for those of us in the east coast. And since we're so dependent, particularly here in south Florida, on water quality, whether it's inland or whether it's drinking, or whether it's marine environment, uh, that, that we, we really have to give special attention to what is going on and what it means for us and ensure that we are, are developing a capability, that we have a capability to be responsive to the hundreds and hundreds of, of individuals who have to make decisions about what to do, about what not to do, and to the hundreds of hundreds of individuals as well who we're gonna rely on to protect our health. So um, red tide isn't something that many of us are familiar with uh, here in South Florida. There are a lot of questions. What does it mean for us? Uh, how long will red tide uh, linger off our coast? What does it mean for our health and the health of our children? Uh, what does it mean for our billion dollar tourism industry, which uh, the region depends upon? Today, hopefully, you will leave here with some of these questions answered. Obviously, if we're doing our job, more questions will be raised as a consequence of the thoughtful discussion that I know uh, you're going to hear. Uh, we, we do see ourselves at FIU as a solutions center. We're willing to take responsibility. We're willing to lean in. That's who we are. That's what we do. Whenever there's a major uh, challenge, whether it's Zika or gun violence, uh, FIU is here. Uh, our talented faculty and researchers, they understand that the life of the mind is also uh, focused on uh, solutions that work for people, for people-oriented solutions. That's what our FIU is all about, and I think this morning is a great, is a great manifestation of that. So, Dean, I want to thank you. I want to thank members of our, of our faculty and professional staff. I want to thank you all. I know it's going to be a, a very, very worthwhile discussion. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, before I forget, uh, please silence your cell phones. I think I got mine, so my back pocket's not gonna start ringing. Um, you know, for me, this, this issue is actually very personal. I'm a marine biologist. I've been on the oceans uh, all over the world all my life. Um, you might wonder how a kid from the cornfields of Ohio got really familiar with red tide. Uh, well, I had a grandma in Naples, and so I grew up on the beaches of the West Coast. Um, I was in those areas during some of these blooms, and then uh, right after I finished my doctorate, I went to Moat Marine Lab and was working on sharks and trying to work on sharks in the middle of these blooms. And believe me, you cannot breathe. It is dangerous. Um, it is devastating, and not just to the marine life, but to the communities around there. Um, so, you know, that's one of the reasons we've created our Institute of Water and Environment to really understand these problems get the early warning, and then develop solutions so that we can have vibrant coastal ecosystems um, and vibrant uh, communities next to them. Um, and so, you know, I really want to thank our panel for being here to provide their insights. 
Um, I'm going to introduce the panel and then uh, ask them to you know, give us some brief comments. And then we're going to turn it over for questions and discussions because we really want this to be, be a discussion that involves all of us and uh, you know, help get some of those questions that we may not be thinking of that, that all of you are. So uh, you know, thank you for everybody for your uh, participation. Uh, so our first panelist, uh, Dr. Tom Frankovich, is a research associate professor in our college's uh, Institute of Water and Environment. He's currently monitoring water quality and algal communities where fresh water is discharged into Florida's coastal estuaries. Uh, one thing that Tom will probably talk about is that we have the red tide problem, but it's not the only algae issue we have out there. And sometimes all of these issues get wrapped up into one red tide issue, but understanding the complexities is important. Uh, Tom's research focuses on coastal marine communities relating seagrass macroalgae and diatoms, those are really little tiny algae, uh, to water quality. Uh, then we have Dr. Uh, Jose Aaron Lopez. Uh, he's an assistant professor in the Department of Biological Sciences. And he's a researcher in our Center for Aquatic Chemistry and the Environment. Uh, he specializes on the effects of natural and human-made pollution on both plants and animals. And this includes uh, the effects of algae. Uh, we then have uh, Dr. Kathleen Ryan. Uh, she is a professor of chemistry and is an expert on algal toxins, including, including those that cause red tide. And if you have not seen her video online about red tide, check it out. It is an excellent primer on, on what's going on. Um, her expertise includes potential routes of exposure to algal toxins, the impacts of red tide on marine life, and effects on human health. And hey, I study marine mammals, so we got to add effects on manatees, too. Um, uh, then we have uh, uh, Dean and Dr. Uh, Tomas Giarte. He's the Dean of the Robert Stemple uh, College of Public Health and Social Work. Uh, he's a neurotoxicologist, and his research explores the impact of environmental pollutants on neurological and mental disease. Uh, earlier this year, he received the Distinguished Toxicologist Award from the Hispanic Organization of Toxicologists. And obviously his work is absolutely critical to understanding how these uh, red tides affect human health. Uh, then we have uh, Dr. Carolyn Lusby, uh, an assistant professor in the Chaplin School of Hospitality and Tourism Management. She specializes in tourism in the environment, uh, tourism and uh, its impacts on the environment, and experiential learning through travel. Uh, can I sign up? Uh, <laughs> We weren't expecting that, were you? Uh, she's given uh, many presentations on, on a variety of topics, including ecotourism, community-based tourism, recreational boating, and sustainability in tourism and hospitality. Um, and then finally on the end, we have Brian Van Hook, Associate Director of the Florida Small Business Development Center in the College of Business. Uh, prior to joining FIU, Brian was Policy Director of the U.S. Senate Committee on Small Business and Entrepreneurship, where he oversaw research and legislative activities. He specializes in disaster recovery and the business community. Um, so we're going to now open it up for our panel to give some brief remarks. Let's try to keep it to two or three minutes. Uh, then when we have questions, uh, I ask that people uh, approach the microphones and please tell us who you are uh, before you ask your questions. So with that, I turn it over uh, to Dr. Frankovich. Uh, good morning, uh, and thank you, uh, President Rosenberg and Dean Heidhouse for convening this uh, teach-in. As uh, President Rosenberg said, it was only about less than two weeks ago, it was uh, September 30th, where red tide was first confirmed on the East Coast. This was the same organism that's been blooming on the West Coast, causing all the problems for the last year, that was last fall that that started. So it has a potential to be very dangerous uh, to our community. Uh, so far, it, um, this red tide's been detected from St. Lucie down the, down the hole over inlet. Uh, the organism that uh, responsible, Karenia brevis, is a natural part of the system, but over the last 50 years, it has increased in frequency and, in, and intensity. This, um, this organism is also what's specifically called the Florida red tide. There's actually, as, as Mike said, many, many species of red tide organisms. They all respond differently to different environmental cues. Some may occur within the estuary, some occur offshore, some occur with, uh, with local canals. So, you know, we need to understand um, the function and dynamics of different communities, not just, not just this one, because we are affected and we are affected by all of them. You may recall it was uh, last last two years where we had the blue-green algae bloom in the St. Lucie estuary, and that made national news. 
Um, that is also another possibility for happening here in Florida. Those things don't go away. Um, so I can assure you that, uh, you know, as scientists here, you know, we are working uh, towards a great understanding, increasing our understanding of these phytoplankton dynamics and understanding uh, and offering possible solutions that may decrease that trend toward increased uh, phytoplankton blooms and intensities. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Aaron Lopez. So thank you. Thank you very much, Ian Halitos and, and President Rosenberg. And also thank you very much to the community members that are here today because I think, and that's one of the things that I was discussing with my, my fellow members of the community uh, and on the panel here, that that is something that involves not just the scientists but also the community. And obviously we need the help of the community in order to address these problems, in order to know where these uh, events might be happening, in order to get a really rapid response in the field that might help us understand what's going on and to take those measures as soon as possible in order to prevent that thing from going further or happening again. So in my case, uh, I'm more uh, focused in laboratory work, uh, combine it uh, with field work, and essentially uh, uh, the kind of, of research that we develop within the Institute of Water and Environment has to do with the effects that these toxins produced by these mic microalgae have on the, genetic on the genetic material. So probably, I mean, for sure you know by now that this is our, uh, something that has critical health effects both on human populations but also marine coastal communities, but that is through the effect these toxins have actually damaging DNA, and that is something that our work here at FIU has revealed last year, and essentially something that has us concerned about like not just the current effects but also the effects that that might have for future generations. And obviously I'm gonna leave like the kind of uh, health component for for my, my fellow speakers here, but you know, I can uh, tell you a little bit more about what this is representing for our shellfish communities, also for our mangrove forests, and also even for coral reefs that indirectly I'm going to be like impacted by these events. So one thing that actually surprised me a lot was precisely like the unusual presence of these events in the Florida East Coast, which is something that is completely um, not unheard of, uh, but it's something that is quite concerning because of us, uh, of like South Florida being a, a heavily populated area, and also we cannot forget about like the triggers of these harmful algal blooms, which have to do with global climate change, but also with the interaction of other effects such as increasing water temperature or the discharge of nut nutrients to the water. So again, this is one of the things that uh, when, when a bloom or an episode such as that one is approaching our coasts is something that we might take uh, action in order to understand what's going on and in order to be able to figure out the measures that we can take in order to detect and prevent that from happening again. And actually from the Institute of Water and Environment right now at FIU, we are deploying a multi-level approach in order to go from oceanographic monitoring to uh, marine <clears throat> assessment of, of impact at the level of genetic materials and also like quantification of different types of algae. There is actually helping us getting a broader picture of these episodes and try to, uh, to come up with, with these solutions. So, well, I'll be happy to ask any questions, to answer any questions about that later on, so. Dr. Ryan. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, I wanna thank the organizers for putting this event together and for all of you for being here. Um, as Dean Heidhouse told you, my area of expertise is on the toxins that are produced by this or organism, Karenia brevis. So the organism produces a suite of neurotoxins. They're neurotoxic because they stimulate nerve cells to fire at times when they should be quiet. Um, the compounds are odorless, colorless, tasteless, and unfortunately, they are quite stable. No amount of heat or cooking will cause them to decompose. Humans are exposed to these toxins through a couple of different routes, and uh, the first and most common is the consumption of contaminated shellfish, and the second is through the inhalation of aerosols. So the consumption of contaminated shellfish results in a syndrome that we call neurotoxic shellfish poisoning, or NSP. It's characterized by um, abdominal symptoms, nausea, diarrhea, abdominal pain, muscle aches, loss of balance and motor coordination, which uh, goes to the neurotoxic effects, numbness, tingling in the extremities, mouth and lips. Sort of a, a hallmark symptom is something we call temperature sensation reversal, where hot feels cold and cold feels hot. Kind of an odd uh, uh, symptom. In severe cases, you can see um, partial paralysis, respiratory distress, and uh, even seizures. 
The symptoms last from hours to days. An oral lethal dose in mice is about one half to one milligram per kilogram of body weight, and that's actually pretty high, right? I don't know of any mortalities, any, any human mortalities that have been caused by uh, these toxins. And due to effective monitoring by the state of Florida, by the Florida Department of Agriculture, only 21 cases of NSP were reported from 1997 to 20, 2010. And 20 out of 21 of these cases uh, were caused as a result of people sh uh, harvesting shellfish when there were bans, recreational harvesting of shellfish, when there were bans on shellfish har harvesting, often by tourists who were unaware of the risks of harvesting uh, shellfish during a red tide. So the risk of exposure is highest from eating tainted shellfish. Uh, however, recent experiments have shown that brevitoxins can accumulate in fish, both omnivorous and planktivorous fish, uh, with the highest concentration in the organs. So we don't generally eat the organs of fish, right? We eat the muscle where the toxin is, is the least concentrated. Uh, the second route of exposure is through inhalation of toxin-containing aerosols. Uh, this organism is actually quite fragile, and it will break up in the waves, and uh, the aerosols can carry the toxin up to two miles inland, at least on the west coast. They've seen this uh, happening. These symptoms include throat, through, rest, through inhalation exposure, include throat irritation, sneezing, coughing, itchy, watery <coughs> eyes, burning of the throat and upper respiratory tract. The symptoms are particularly acute in people with asthma and COPD, and those people are advised to stay away from the beach or get into an air-conditioned environment during a red tide. For those who need to be on the beach during red tide, lifeguards, um, uh, the use of a surgical mask is advised. So the toxins are not water-soluble. Um, they don't stay in the water for long, but they also don't readily decompose. And they will absorb, adsorb onto basically any organic material uh, that's nearby. So brevitoxins and their metabolites have been found to persist in sediments and seagrass communities for up to eight months after a bloom. And that's kind of a, wraps up what I have to say about toxins, and I'll pass Thank it you. along to my good, colleague. Good morning. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Um, I think this is an extremely timely and important public health issue that, that we're discussing today. And uh, I'm going to come into this uh, discussion from two perspectives. One is that I am a neurotoxicologist, so it is my business to understand how these chemicals affect the brain. And we do know quite a bit about the mechanism of action. And then I'm also a dean of public health. I've been in public health all my academic life. So we want to... Um, take care of the health of the public. So the first rule in public health is what? Prevention, right? We want to prevent people from being exposed to any chemical that's going to uh, produce harmful effects. Now, obviously, that's not always possible. And individuals or communities that live near the ocean or lakes or, in fact, any body of water where a lot of these algae bloom occur are potentially being exposed. Now, Dr. Ryan was very comprehensive and said a lot of things that I was going to say. So you already know it. So there's two things about that, uh, that, that I would like to note or add. One thing is that these brevotoxins, and by the way, it is not one or two. There are many, hundreds. And there are many hundreds and thousands of uh, uh, marine toxins that occur in different parts of the world, and they've been happening for years and years. I think the frequency of these algal boons is what, what's becoming more uh, increasingly um, um, problematic. So one thing that I'd like to add is that, in particular for the brevotoxins, they're lipophilic. So what does that mean? It can go through the blood-brain barrier, so the brain is typically protected by what we call the brain blood barrier. It's actually the capillary that forms tight junctions and prevent a lot of environmental pollutants to get into the brain. But if you're lipophilic, the doors open for you and you can easily enter the brain. So these brevotoxins are lipophilic. Now there's a lot, as you just heard from Dr. Ryan, there's a lot of things that we know about it. But also there's lots of things that we don't know. For example, what happens when you have repeated exposure at low levels over time? 
we have no idea of what the potential health effects of chronic low-level exposure to these chemicals can do to us from a public health perspective. So from a public health perspective, we're concerned about the, the, the routes of exposures, but also the dose that humans are potentially uh, involved. Those are critically important component, components for us to be able to understand the, the health effect consequences of exposure to these type of, of algae blooms. So I will leave it at that, and I would just say that um, uh, we are here at FIU, uh, a solution center, and right now we are beginning to uh, take investigations in collaboration with the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry, a case uh, in trying to understand and learn more about the neurotoxic uh, potential of a lot of these uh, marine toxins. Thank you. All right, good morning. So I'm here to just give a perspective on tourism and how the red tide issue is impacting tourism. Um, there are many angles I could take, but it just, I just wanted to introduce um, tourism in general. As you guys know, because you all live here, it is our number one industry. It supports um, a lot of jobs. It's over $112 billion in visitor spending that we're making off tourism. Um, just out of taxes, we're making $11 billion. So needless to say, um, a lot of these tourists come for our beaches, for our pristine environment. And our tourism product depends on a quality resource, be that good beaches and clean waters. Um, and so with that, we need to take actions just from an economic perspective to save our um, primary attraction. Um, as you've heard from my colleagues, it's a very complex and interrelated issue. And especially with marine resource management, it's not localized. We are dependent on ocean currents. Um, you know, you saw it's mainly a West Coast phenomenon, and yet here we are. Um, it's also related to what happens on land. And so we need to take integrated coastal soil management into consideration, you know, and, and really look at what's happening on land. What are we doing um, on land that's impacting our beaches? Um, in terms of tourism and what we could stand to lose. Um, I was looking at the BP oil spill, which you guys probably remember in 2010, and um, visitors did stop coming for a while. Now, we always bounce back. We do know that. How long that takes depends on so many factors, who the tourists are, right? Um, why they come, um, their research. We know, and I think you mentioned that, that tourists actually know less than residents about the issues, right? So there is that effect of, well, where is it actually? And what does it mean, right? Um, they're more likely to not know about some of the dangers of it. Um, so from some of the studies from 2010, we know that um, travelers researched less on TripAdvisor, um, and we lost about $240 million in spending. So if you think, if we're losing even just 5% of the visitors, this is a huge loss in income, and I'll leave it at that for now and pass it on. Well, thank you. And I want to thank President Rosenberg and Dean Heidhouse for the opportunity to be on this distinguished panel. Uh, my name is Brian Van Hook, and I'm Associate Director of the Florida Small Business Development Center here under the College of Business. Um, our center works with approximately 900 businesses a year. We focus on business growth. So we want to help a business increase revenue, um, increase jobs, get a contract, get capital. Um, but we would say, basically, you know, we focus on business growth, so we help you in blue skies and gray skies. Um, and hopefully not under red tide as well. Um, and my background, actually, I grew up in South Louisiana. Um, so like a lot of businesses in South Louisiana, down here in South Florida, you know, you keep a trained eye on the Gulf, you know, during hurricane season. Um, a lot of businesses there, um, you know, we had to deal with Hurricane Katrina, you know, where folks thought that New Orleans was closed two years after the storm. You know, people would come to me and say, I'd really like to help recovery there. You know, what can I do? Um, you know, can I give money? I'd say, go down there and spend money. Go to the French Quarter, didn't flood. Everything's back up and running. And that was like a year later, two years later. Um, also, the same thing with the oil spill. You know, the oil spill, the BP oil spill, that impacted, um, you know, a lot of the tourism uh, tr numbers, a lot of the tourism coming there. Folks would think that New Orleans was underwater. South Louisiana was, you know, in dealing with the oil. Um, that really impacted people's ability to spend. Um, from our center's perspective, we work on that business growth, but we also help businesses be prepared and also recover from disasters such as this. Um, and we're hearing from a lot of businesses that literally just recovered from Hurricane Irma. They just got their federal dollars from the Small Business Administration. You know, we've just got them back up and running. And then now they pick up the phone and call us again. Now we're concerned about red tide. Um, particularly a business over in Miami Beach that um, a restaurant, she was doing very well before Hurricane Irma, 
uh, basically had a, a number of impacts from Hurricane Irma, um, just got her back up and running, and then she reads in the newspaper about, you know, red tide, you know, potentially in Miami-Dade and Miami Beach. Um, she's concerned about the slowdown in tourists. So a lot of what we do is working with businesses to be prepared, um, focusing on business continuity as like a competitive advantage, um, but also just helping businesses think through different strategies. I can tell you my colleagues up in Florida Gulf Coast um, Community College and um, on, up in Palm Beach, they're working 24-7 to help businesses impacted in those areas by this, whether that's accessing capital, you know, coming up with new marketing strategies. And so for us, you know, we're hoping, knock on wood, we don't have to deal with that here. But as the panelists are telling you, I think it's time for us to raise awareness and also from a business perspective, um, make some preparations and also think through some additional things we can do to protect the economy. So thanks again. I'm happy to answer your questions. And also I want to say I'm from South Louisiana. I had to do a double take with the gentleman with the New Orleans Saints uh, jersey. I thought maybe you were one of my family members here. So thanks, <laughs> thanks for being my, uh, my fan club. Well, thank you very much, panel. Uh, lots of food for thought there. I think we've got a microphone we're going to bring up here uh, for questions. And while we deal with those technical aspects so we can open up to questions, I'm going to invite uh, President Rosenberg to uh, kick it off with the first question here. So uh, I am, there, there's so many facets here, but I, I would like to get some clarity about the potential impact of red tide on Biscayne Bay and the entire Bay Area. What, what are the scenarios? Is it premature to be concerned about that? What does that look like? I, uh, maybe I'll start off on that one. Uh, this uh, Karenia brevis, this organism, um, is uh, restricted to marine areas. So if it comes in the, in the Biscayne Bay, it, 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 it's going to be in those areas where it's near normal salinity uh, towards the edge, but it, it, it should not expand up into the upper reaches of the uh, Biscayne Bay, upper reaches of the estuary. In fact, if you look at the um, map of the occurrence of Karenia brevis in the Gulf of Mexico, you'll notice in that map around the whole Gulf, there is a big hole in that map, and that big hole is right where the Gulf, I mean, sorry, the uh, Mississippi River comes out. So that's the, we, uh, the areas we should be looking for in Biscayne Bay are, you know, the safety valve, all those areas that have an exchange uh, with the Atlantic. Hi, uh, I'm Susan Jacobson from the Department of Journalism and Media. So I have a quick question. Um, it seems now when we say red tide, it's not just Florida red tide that we're talking about, but there's a few different things going on, like the blue-green algae may have a connection to phosphorus runoff. Um, would you please comment a little bit about that, and does it make sense to look at policies that might regulate to a certain extent the amount of nutrients we are putting into the water? Thank you. Great. So, uh, I can, I can address that. So, um, I mean, obviously, I mean, there are like several factors that make uh, Florida really uh, the, the best place for these harmful algal blooms to occur. And that has to do with the, with the sun, and also with the temperature of the water. Obviously, we have changes in water salinity uh, cycles, but obviously, that is something that, um, under this context of global climate change scenario, is going to be leading to more frequency of these episodes and those episodes being uh, longer. So again, what you have to keep in mind is that these Florida red tides as well as any other harmful algal bloom is something that is a natural consequence of ecological successions in coastal areas. The thing is that it's getting out of hand precisely because of these alterations in those parameters. Obviously, there are many of those things, most of those things that I mentioned, if not all, we cannot change. I mean, we are talking about like long-term but when it comes to the critical ingredient in here, and thus that is like the nutrients going out into the water, I mean, that's obviously something that we can act upon. And that is something that is like really, I think that the, the, the real important element fostering those blooms being like more frequent and larger in extent. And as you very well uh, pointed out, I mean, we're not just talking about current everything in here, we're just talking about like many other types of hard follicle blooms caused by, as you say, like the, blue-green algae, which as a matter of fact, they are not algae, they are bacteria, but again, I mean, there's like a different flavor of pretty much the same group of things that at the end of the day, maybe not directly through toxins, but through like altering uh, the normal um, physiology, let's say, of seagrass or other uh, uh, organisms in coastal areas are going to end up like causing these 
uh, alterations, massive die-offs, and obviously that brief or like that, not brief, that, that uh, persistent alteration of those balances is obviously something that is, is putting in jeopardy like the future of those ecosystems here in South Florida. So to make a long story short and to answer your, your question, I think, and I agree with you that precisely managing those wastewaters, uh, agricultural rain, runoff, and those nutrients going into the, into the water is pretty much one of the, the priorities we should be pursuing. And just to follow up on that, if we could get the microphone to uh, Dr. Jim Forkren, one of the uh, world's experts on uh, seagrass and coastal marine ecosystems, uh, and now honorary panel member. No, I'm not going to make statements, but uh, I'm going to ask a couple more marine biology questions before I think the rest of the crowd is interested in asking about economic impact and, and direct toxicity. Uh, Dr. Frankovic, you mentioned that there were multiple kinds of red tides, but then everyone else is talking about blue-green algae. So I have two parts. Would you talk about multiple types of red tides? And then also, whenever I see anyone on the beach in South Florida talking in front of a news camera about red tide, they're always standing in front of this reddish algae washed up on the beach. <laughs> is that related? Sure. Uh, uh, red, tide, uh, red tide, the term red tide is a catch-all for a uh, great variety of, of different algae. Most of the time, they're specifically talking about microalgae, single-celled phytoplankton, and in Flor uh, or, or other harmful algal blooms. In, in Florida, there's about 30 phytoplankton species that, that are known to cause harmful algal blooms in Florida. But as Jim mentioned, uh, we've also had a problem the last two years and throughout the Caribbean of proliferation and accumulation of sargasm. This is the uh, planktonic sargasm that floats on the top that uh, fishermen often target for, uh, for dolphin fishing. This, there's been a proliferation of that that's been washing up on the beaches. It's been rotting and smelling. Um, most of the times that's not called a red tide. I wouldn't call it a red tide. And you know, specifically here in Florida, when we're referring to Karenia brevis, the ones causing the most devastating uh, red, red tides on the west coast, uh, they specifically refer to that as the Florida red tide. And so just to summarize this, for, uh, for those who are walking around and want to you know, identify what you're seeing, you've got the sargassum, which is the big rolls of stuff you get on the beach. It's kind of crunchy, can form kind of big piles. That comes from offshore in the ocean. We've got the red tide, which is kind of stains in the water, but it's not big and fluffy. That can kill fish. And then you've got the blue-green algae, which is the bacteria. And that's what you see on the news a lot in the Indian River Lagoon with these big just goops of green stuff. And so it's kind of three different problems, but I think bringing it back to that question, it is all linked to we've got temperature and then we have nutrients coming off the fresh water, which is why Everglades restoration is so critical and it's not just a problem. And we heard the panel say, this is not just a problem of oceans, it's a problem of the whole integrated system and how we manage uh, the lands here. And we're gonna- I tried quickly, Yes, you- <laughs> Sure. Um, uh, my, my office and, uh, and, and lab is a field office down, down in Key Largo, and oftentimes we get members of the public uh, stop by to ask questions or to bring, sa uh, bring samples in. And just last Tuesday when we were uh, preparing a uh, phytoplankton monitoring plan, I had stepped outside just to stretch my legs, and I uh, met a, a local citizen, and, and he said, hey, I got, a, um, I got a red tide in the canal. And I was, you know, a bit skeptical because, you know, I know, you know, Florida red tide. This is a, this is an offshore species. This is nothing we find normally in, inside estuaries. But I was interested, and sure enough, I went and uh, I took a sample. I went down to the canal, took a sample, brought it back, and put it under the microscope. And um, my first reaction when I looked at it was, "Oh crap!" And it, it wasn't "Oh crap" because. I knew this was a harmful algal species, but I, th this was a specific type of phytoplankton uh, belonging to the flagellates, which are notoriously difficult to identify. So I said, oh, I'm going to have to spend a lot of time with this guy to figure out what it was. Luckily, uh, it was actually one of the easier ones. It was a larger species, and we were able to identify it. And it actually was a harmful algal species. Uh, it was a, a, a taxa uh, by the name of Phyracapsa japonica. Uh, very rarely reported. Um, but it's not unexpected that we would find it in a, in a canal. A lot of these canals have restricted circulation. They're very rich in organic matter. Um, they're 
you know, little, you know, little tiny hot pots for, uh, for growing algae. So uh, there's, a, there's a lot of surprises that we find. And you know, without these citizen scientists or, or, or concerned citizens, I mean, this citizen was obviously aware of red tide because of the, the, it, it, it being uh, in, the, in the media. And you know, he was uh, concerned enough to say, hey, come on down, you know, anybody take a look and take a look at a sample. So uh, you know, I'm very happy to ha have those people stop by and I definitely encourage anyone here uh, to keep your eyes open and, uh, and share what you see. Okay, where do you share? There's an excellent, uh, excellent site to share that. Uh, the best, one of the best labs in the whole world is right here in Florida in St. Pete. That's the Harmful Algal Bloom Lab. And they have a, uh, a website which is phenomenal. It's uh, myfwc slash red tide status, all one word. Um, they have a volunteer program. You can sign up for it, and they will send you bottles with preservative. You can send them. You can you, you get those bottles. You fill them up, put them in their FedEx package, and they'll deliver it. And they will let you know what they found in it, and also becomes part of their database. So that's uh, one aspect. They also have a, a, a fish kill hotline, which you can call it and report fish kills. And again, those. Uh, those numbers for those uh, fish kill and the, uh, and the phytoplankton blooms can be found at that website I said. Great. In the back here. Hello. Um, my question has to can do... You, can I uh, ask you to introduce yourself, please? Oh, yes. Uh, my, name is, my name is Evan Marcus. I'm a PhD grad student in uh, Global Sociocultural Studies at SIPA here at FIU. And my question is, uh, you had pointed to the fluctuations in climate that are gonna cause long-term uh, differentiations, I guess, in red tide uh, for Florida, as well as the nutrient runoff, which has to do with land management practices. So my question is, as scientists who work very closely with these issues and understand uh, what each, what each factor contributes to the increasing red tide. Do scientists have a place at the table when it comes to policy discussions for land management practices, or how do you guys interact with, uh, how do you guys translate your science into public policy? Well, that is something that, you know, usually uh, we'd like to have more present, that's obvious, but uh, when it comes to our present, that has to do with like the presence of stakeholders and discussions when these programs are actually announced, especially in opportunities for funding. So obviously that's a voice that's heard, although I think it could be heard more, and specifically reaching out into uh, uh, initiatives such as this one in order to look for feedback. Because again, I mean, obviously, we are in ground zero for, for global ch climate change, and this is something that is going to keep happening more and more often. I can tell you about my experience in Europe where they suffer from harmful algal blooms, but they are not nearly as critical as they are here. And there's one simple reason. I mean, they happen because, as I said, it is normal. But obviously, it is not like such a, a brew of temperature and, and changes in water quality and like uh, development in coastal areas, same as, that's, as we have in here, right? So again, I mean, there are like all the traditional channels to interact with policymakers at the time of making uh, like scientific feedback being more present in these uh, solicitations or, or funding opportunities. But hopefully because of, of events such as this one and, and things that are going to follow, there will be a great opportunity actually to revise that and, and wait a little bit more into those initiatives. That's and, my kind of... Well. And I'd like to turn this to our business and uh, tourism uh, focus as well. I mean, so us scientists will always say we need a bigger place at the table in policy discussions. But I think from the perspective of the business and, and uh, you know, tourism fields, mm -hmm. is there a feeling there's more need for science in the discussion or is the interest more in that, you know, looking for capital and marketing? Um, well, I'll go first. Um, I think from the business perspective, you know, the biggest thing is just kind of getting the information out. And for a lot of businesses, it's kind of like the not knowing or kind of the gray area that's the most concerned because for businesses, you have to plan long term. You know, you have to make a long term uh, plan and kind of like keep the business going. So the concern that we're seeing from a lot of businesses is just the certainty in terms of knowing what's what's going on and kind of making those business decisions. Should I hire an additional employee? 
you know, should I change my marketing? Should I, instead of marketing to tourists, should I start marketing to locals? Um, those are a lot of things that our center can help with. But I know that there is a lot of concern, and particularly the thing I'm concerned about from this disaster from Red Tide is just look at, you know, the federal government last year was focused a lot on Hurricane Irma recovery, but they were also focused on Hurricane Maria, Hurricane Harvey. Then we just had the hurricane in North Carolina. We have another hurricane, unfortunately, that's heading up to the panhandle. So the concern that I have is also from a local perspective is having the resources available to small businesses should this become a bigger issue here in Miami-Dade County. Because right now, the governor did add um, Miami-Dade County to the executive order for Red Tide. Um, but there's no assistance that's available. There's no federal assistance through the SBA to Miami-Dade County. There's no um, Florida bridge loans that are available for Miami-Dade County. They're available in the other areas. Um, but my concern is just if some of these other things happen, you know, it's just human nature. The shift focus, there's a focus um, shift. And so I just want to make sure our businesses have the resources they need. And we're really trying to get the information out. Um, to make sure, and then also if we do get um, some of these federal resources brought to bear to this, um, our group is going to hustle and actually try to make sure some of these businesses can take advantage. Because in the short term, um, businesses need working capital. So they need working capital just to keep the doors open, you know, to keep things, operations running. Um, longer term, they do need help on marketing, you know, changing, as I said, changing from, you know, focusing on tourists to more bringing in locals, providing deals, maybe updating the website. Um, maybe if they're a restaurant and they were focused just on the beach, maybe they do catering outside of this. And whenever I hear about this, I think about how our center had to respond to Hurricane, uh, I mean, to uh, Zika. You know, we were canvassing around Wynwood. I slathered up the mosquito repellent and was basically going door to door in about 90 degree temperatures, um, just talking to businesses about what assistance was available, but also talking them through some different strategies that they could come up with. Um, so on, for this, I'm hoping it doesn't impact us here, but we're trying to make businesses aware you know, this could impact you. You need to think through business continuity and think about some different strategies. So I'll turn. Do you right. have anything? Um, yeah, so f of course, I think the tourism industry, even on the international levels, the World Travel and Tourism Council, the World Tourism Organization, are aware that um, policy needs to be influenced, as I mentioned before, from um, just the standpoint of the quality um, resource. And I think um, the one thing that we've all share is just an, an awareness raising from the tourists, um, but also for the providers, um, so that they can know about these issues and then influence policy locally. And um, there are examples where tourists, similar to what you were saying about uh, involving residents and sending in samples, where tourists are actually being used to collect data on the barrier reef, for example, in, in, um, in Australia. How many fish do we have? How are corals changing? Because they're out there. Tourism operators are out there all the time. Why are we not using tourism operators to actually help us collect the data that we need? They're going out there. They're taking tourists out every day on boats. They see how the environment is changing. So it's not only to influence policies, but also to help us collect the data that we need. What over here, then we'll come over here. Thank you, Uzi Darwish from Panther Now. Uh, my question is similar to the gentleman that was asking as far as agriculture, uh, land-based uh, farms and businesses, as far as policy, um, are there any specific like proactive initiatives that are being undertaken to uh, educate people more and to really uh, prevent this sort of, uh, the chemicals from uh, running into the ocean as we've been talking about. So. I'll just make a, a, a quick comment. I think it's important to understand when we talk about nutrients, which is primarily nitrates and phosphates, it's just not from, from fertilizers. It also comes from sewage, from detergents that we use at home. Uh, so there's a variety of different chemicals from different sources that contribute to these excess nutrients in the water that leads to the harmful blooms. I, I'm not sure, I certainly don't know of any direct attempt in educating uh, the, you know, the individuals that uh, use large amounts of fertilizers, um, that this is a direct consequence of, of their usage or how to best manage uh, the use of fertilizers so we don't get this excess of nutrients in, in, the, uh, in the ocean and in lakes. 
I'll just follow up on that. Uh, Dr. Geyser just walked out. I was going to put her on the spot on this one, uh, so she escaped. Um, but I mean, I think there are a few uh, initiatives going on that we have not yet picked up on on the East Coast the way we need to. Uh, the Rookery Bay National Marine Research Estuary has a program working with landscapers to certify them in you know, how to minimize your use of fertilizers or optimize it. And even though you're working dozens of miles away from the ocean, that what you do affects it. Um, and then I think that you know, we have a, a big long-term project on the Everglades ecosystem, and there are you know, those nutrient guidelines for water being discharged that are really, you know, those are science-based <laughs> guidelines. And so I think that some of the work the Everglades Foundation and others are doing to try to make sure that we get the, the water quality right, you know, we've got the big reservoir uh, that should help with Lake Okeechobee. Um, but I mean, I think that, you know, from my perspective, we've got a lot more to go in terms of that education outreach to all the various sectors because, yeah, there, there are many sources where you can get nutrients in the water from, from different distances. So, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so uh, in the, uh, to the back here and wait for the microphone to get to you and please introduce yourself. Hi there, my name is Kara Sidira. I'm a Miami Beach resident. And I wanted to go back to the question about the Biscayne Bay. There are a lot of uh, tour operators, water sports activities, tourists in the bay. And the testing so far is on the parameters because I think maybe of what you were saying, but a lot of the bay is also high salinity. So will we be further testing in the bay to ensure the safety of our tour operators and the visitors? Okay. Yeah, sure. Yeah, just, I'm going to, before you do that, I think if you could also expand on that in terms of the importance of water quality monitoring in general, I think that you, that, that expand on the question if that's okay. Yeah, sure. And I, I'm particularly looking at the red tide testing, which is down at government cut and over at the parameters or perimeter rather than inside of the bay itself. Right, uh, so uh, the importance of water quality monitoring, something that water quality monitoring can tell us, it can, it, it can map out those areas that are specifically conducive to um, development of phytoplankton blooms. Either identify areas of, of higher nutrients and also areas of um, conducive salinity. But you mentioned about, you know, should we be measuring further, further into, into the Biscayne Bay? Absolutely, especially now because now we're going into the dry season. So as we go into the dry season, those higher salinity waters are going to creep closer and closer to the shoreline. So, yeah, we definitely should be moving testing further, further into the estuary. And what are the barriers to moving that in right now? I mean, what has what the di historical direction been of water quality monitoring in South Florida? Are we adding more stations, less stations, especially as we have these yeah, it, um, that seems to respond uh, to emergencies. Um, so, you know, in the past, we had a lot larger um, water quality monitoring network than we, than we presently have. And then it seems there's, uh, over a period of time, there's maybe a little less interest in the funding agencies. And then when, uh, you know, then when we have, do have an emergency like we do have right now, they're, they're, the question, okay, you know, what do we have? Well, we had stuff, you know, 10 years ago. We you know, what do we have recently? So I, I think it's very important that uh, these monitoring programs should be kept up. They should be consistent, even through times when we are not experiencing emergencies. And if I may follow with that a little, just like uh, briefly, something that also requires different like uh, approaches. I mean, we need to essentially articulate a way in which we can uh, use oceanographic information to inform the kind of monitoring we are developing in the Bay and also confirm that with like uh, quantifications of toxins, of microalgae, uh, which species are present in there, and obviously with the, with the purpose of monitoring, but also with the purpose of better modeling what's happening now and what might happen in the future. I think that's something that is really critical and that is something that uh, we are definitely like working to, to advance at least from the side of the FIU at this moment. Great, and I'm gonna, we are uh, broadcasting this to uh, the Biscayne Bay campus. And I have a couple questions here from uh, our high school students at the Mast Academy there. So if you'll humor me with uh, getting a question in from one of our high school students and then we'll uh, bring the microphone uh, to this gentleman here. Um, one of the questions from uh, Elijah Kessler, who's an 11th grade student, was uh, interested in treatment of the effects of red tide. Um, and the question is, is there any not necessarily vaccine, but are there any treatments that are being developed or advances in medicine to help uh, people that are exposed to the red tide toxins? So 
The, the treatments that uh, people are using now are basic, basically palliative care, right? You get someone in, you give them fluids, and you wait for them to excrete the toxins, and that's about it. Um, in some very severe cases, uh, people have required respiratory support, so they needed to be on a respirator. Um, in my lab, we're actually looking at uh, improving those treatments for marine animals, for manatees, um, based on some of the symptoms. But it's very preliminary. Funding started in September. So at the moment, basically, you just take care of the people until they excrete all the toxin. Great. Thank you. Michael, can I follow up? Oh, please. Really, really quick. So, so we do know the mechanism how this brevotoxin affect um, the nervous system, for example. And interestingly enough, there is a new data to suggest that the same organisms can actually synthesize chemicals that antagonize the effect of brevotoxins. So there's a chemical called brevonol. And, you know, there's, we're not quite sure about the mechanism, but, but this could potentially be one approach uh, to treat some of these, uh, some of these uh, health effects. Okay, and so I'm just going to follow up on that because this is a question from Jacob Geller, who's another 11th grade student. Um, are there any organisms, I mean, you mentioned some of the red tide organisms. Are there any other organisms that seem to have immunity uh, to the negative effects of red tide or that have developed resistance? Oh, certainly. Um, shellfish, uh, they tend to make metabolites or they... they uh, alter the structure of the compounds, and then they just store them in their fatty tissue. Uh, that's why shellfish are so dangerous for us to eat. Um, in the Pacific Northwest, where they have a different toxin uh, called saxitoxin, it's a different organism, different red tide, they found that the shellfish actually have different kinds of ion channels. They have a mutation that makes them resistant to this toxin. So yeah, we have seen that in nature. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Please remember to introduce yourself. Yes. Uh, hi, good morning, my name is Jose Chang. I'm a PhD student working in Dr. Ryan's laboratory. And so I think research on this particular issue is extremely important and support for that research therefore is extremely important. Um, so my question is, uh, what immediate impact Will current research at FIU Worlds Ahead research at FIU, specifically on the major red tide culprit, Karenia brevis, uh, make on Floridian coastal ecosystems, public health, and economic growth? I think we're going to have to get a few answers on this one because they're, because I mean, and I think this is a great question. So, yeah, what are the solutions? And maybe think, you know, short term, we've got a bloom. What directions are we going to mitigate that? from the science to the business to the health, but then also long-term, what are we looking at here? How do we fix this, not just talk about what it is or what yeah. caused it? So, so that's a great question, very comprehensive. So I'm gonna just address one component. So today we do know quite a bit about the acute effects of exposure to these uh, toxic chemicals. What bothers me or what, what sort of keep me up at night is the long-term consequences. We don't have any idea what the effects, the health effects are of chronic but low level exposures. And we do know that some of these uh, toxins are concentrated, for example, in the liver of fish, and they can remain there for a year, even after the, the algal bloom. So we may be consuming foods, fish or shellfish that bioaccumulates many of these toxins. And we could be doing this repeatedly over time at very low levels that oftentimes we don't recognize the immediate consequences, but they have long-term consequences. So that's the one part that really um, requires a lot more research to be done in trying to understand the long-term effects. I, I would say that uh, you know my preference would be to uh, prevent these blooms from happening in the first place, or or try to reduce the severity of the, these blooms rather than addressing yeah. the the Agreed. effects later on. Um, but as as Tom said, uh, we really don't know what the effects of the long term chronic exposure is. We look at these acute exposures and uh, what because it's. It's easier to study, right? It's hard to tease out those long-term and chronic uh, effects. Um, so, uh, you know, hopefully we can come up with a simple solution for manatees. <laughs> They're mammals. 
And maybe we can apply that someday to, to help people who are poisoned by these toxins as well. If uh, from my end I can add to that, that precisely I think it's really interesting what both uh, Dr. Rain and Dr. Aguilarte were pointing out about the sublethal exposure, because it's not only the sublethal exposure that we humans or marine life is going to be uh, experiencing over time, and obviously we are not going to know what's going to happen until like time enough is, is gone, and obviously that we are looking, right? But there's another thing in there, and that is like the genotoxic effects that these toxins have. I mean, it's not just the toxin altering like neural function, but also the damage that those uh, toxins can cause to DNA. And that is obviously something that, uh, uh, for those of you who are not familiar, is the same as talking as mutations in the DNA. It's the same thing as you experience if you are experiencing mutations because of the effect of the ultraviolet sun or mutations that might conduce to conditions such as cancer or any other. So that goes for marine life as well as for human populations. And obviously that is something that uh, on the long term, like, uh, and, and, and I go back again to these events being more recurrent and more uh, longer in, in time. I mean, that means that this is the same as saying that we are experiencing like longer exposures to these sublethal dose of like these toxins. And that is something that obviously for the uh, industries, economy, I mean, that is obviously like right there, but that must be also complemented from the health sciences and, and ecosystem uh, restoration purposes. Just before we go to the next one, any uh, comments on short-term and long-term solutions from the preventing blooms or you know, what we might need to do on the informing tourist side? Uh, sure. I, I don't think we, have, we can do anything to, to stop the initiation of these blooms. These blooms have been around since, uh, actually, the, the, the original Spanish explorers to, Fl to Florida observed it. So these things have been around for a long, long time. They're responding to things in the environment that were here long before humans were. Uh, but uh, as I said before, the uh, intensity and extent of these blooms has increased over the past 50 years. That's coincident with the development and population growth of Florida. Uh, we suspect that has a lot to do with our, our nutrient addition to the uh, to the coast. So, you know, there are some common sense, you know, common sense things that can be done. You know, we can, uh, you know, decrease our, our nutrient inputs to the system. And also, at the same time, we can uh, preserve and enhance the natural filters in the system. These are the uh, seagrasses, mangroves, and marshes, and all these things filter out these nutrients. You know, we should be, uh, again, you know, preserving them, making sure these uh, systems stay intact. Um, as you know, you mentioned something about tourism. Something, I had a question for, for, from some of my business colleagues. Um, Oftentimes, I hear from um, some of the uh, business owners in the Keys, and you know they don't want to know. That they don't want people to know about the algae bloom. They they say, hey, you know, we, don't don't tell the stuff. Everything's fine here. We don't want to know. So there so there's a there's a disconnect with the the amount of information about the extent of these blooms, where these things are occurring. You know, maybe we can do a better job in saying, hey, you know, right now these blooms are limited to a certain area, but things are a okay in the Keys. You know, please, you know, come on down. Uh, we know we've seen the same kind of effect with the BP oil spill, which you know the keys the keys were not affected, but they you know the, the negative um, negative press and, and, and all the deservedly, but also that it was uh, inaccurately also attributed to the keys. So I wonder if you can comment on. So that. how do you titrate that information flow uh, appropriately? Yeah, well, um, well, I'll let uh, Carolyn respond too, but I know that for tourism, it's not just a button you turn on or you turn off. Basically, right. if you think about the BP oil spill, or like I said, Hurricane Katrina, you know, it takes like a year or two years, three years to really go. And that's uh, even with sustained marketing campaigns to get people to come back, you know, working through Expedia and other folks. Um, so that's the concern I hear from a lot of business owners is the concern about basically what's happening but also the concern about you know seeing a dead fish on the newspaper attributed to the beach that they're located next to you know that's something that's really problematic um, especially if you're like on the water you saw your restaurant as being like in the keys you know eating on the water um, you know and then you're gonna have all the folks go away from that so I think that there is that balance um, but I think a lot of the business owners we work with they're very community focused they want to help the community you know they want to get information out you know they want the community to to grow um, so they are interested if there's ways that they can help like you said bringing you guys information you know tips things like that um, the one thing i would say kind of shameless plug is if it, if a business owner is impacted by red tide in miami-dade county um, the state has a website that's floridadisaster.biz 
And on that website, you can basically go there and fill out a very short business assessment survey. Um, I know nobody likes to hear about surveys, but this is a good survey for a purpose um, because this actually helps inform the state of Florida and also the federal government on what counties are seeing a direct impact from this. Um, and so right now, the governor did add Miami-Dade County to his executive order for Red Tide, um, but there is no assistance available, no monetary assistance available to businesses here. Um, so I would encourage you guys, if you're watching and you're a business owner in Miami Beach or one of the northern beaches, um, if you do see a direct impact from this, um, go to that website, floridadisaster.biz, um, because that would help us kind of help you in terms of getting the resources and getting the information out. So I'll turn it over to her. Yeah, so like he was mentioning, that, that, that fear of losing all, all this um, income, potential income, right, does create a little bit of that, oh, maybe we shouldn't um, tell that. But I think actually the, with all the technology we have now, putting the right information out. You know, people are, are, are really um, motivated by, by knowing the facts. And this um, effect that he was mentioning was called the generalization effect. And that's very, very, a very real phenomenon in tourism is that it might happen in one particular beach, but for a tourist, they don't know. They don't know Palm Beach from Fort Lauderdale. It's, it's, they're going to generalize it. And so for us, we're actually not doing ourselves a favor by hiding information. In contrary, we should be putting more information out. We should be putting out exactly which beach is a green beach or not. I mean, we've just red and green. We could just do it as simple as that, keep it very easy for our international tourists. Um, and so people know which beach is a go, which reef is clear. Um, because currents change. It could change from today to tomorrow. You could be in West Palm Beach on a vacation and tomorrow might be fine. You know, it just depends. Um, so I think there's that. And in terms of the consumers and strategies, um, I think it's, it takes a village. And we really need to change our consumption behaviors on, on, a, on a general scale. And to that, I know that we have to make it easy for the consumer, and we have to make it not more costly to buy sustainable and to buy green, um, so that we can really change those consumption behaviors. So, so Mike, I, I would just add, I think it's very important to have timely, credible, and accurate information. It's not only good for business, but it's good for public health. And there are many ways that can be done. An excellent point, and I think that getting to that is uh, a critical step that we need to make. And I mean, I think that's one of the things we heard. We've got a question here on the end. We'll get the microphone to you. But I mean, I think that's one of the things we hear about the confusion and seeing sargassum, which just rolls up on the beach and linked to red tide. It's really important that the information is handed to, or is getting out to the public in the right way. Because um, sometimes you get, you know, the over, you need people to know where the challenges are, but they're also the possibility for scaring people away from perfectly good areas and, and beaches. Um, just to continue following up to on that, Mike. Yourself. My name is Kevin Senecal. Uh, I own a business called Divers Direct. We have stores from uh, Key West to Orlando. Mm -hmm. Very affected by what's going on um, in the Keys. Interestingly enough, we actually are <laughs> hearing people, hearing customers expressing concern over red tide. Um, and so first things first, I just wanted to follow up on this misinformation. I had a guy in my office last week observe Channel 6 run the story about Hollandale Beach having red tide. At the same time, they're running a video of a Venice sheriff's boat dragging a dead manatee. So <clears throat> I would urge our media members to try to get the stories as close to right as possible. To run a video from the West Coast while talking about the East Coast certainly confuses the issue. Mm -hmm. um, so that's just a, <laughs> a bit of a plug as a tourism operator that we can't, at least our local media could get it right, that would be awesome. Um, second thing, my question then for the panel or even just for Mike is, I, I think there are some solid solutions out there for these things that are already in the works um, that per perhaps are underfunded, but they have been starting to get a lot of attention in the governor's race and the senator's race. Um, so if we could talk a little bit about how far along are we on Everglades restoration, how important is the fixing the dike, <laughs> and, uh, and also the, uh, run the issue of, of uh, sewer. I mean, I know that there's solutions where instead of dumping sewage offshore, which we do, you know, the pipes, particularly in Broward County, where they're releasing, I think there are solutions in place, scientific solutions for both of those things, but yet they don't seem to be getting executed fast enough, and I think it's exacerbating the issues we're seeing now. Excellent. Well, it's a great question. The beauty of being moderator is I can punt the question to somebody that knows far more than I do, and Dr. Geyser, uh, made her way back into the room, so. Uh. Yeah. 
sorry about that. NBC was here and they wanted to do a quick interview. Um, so anyway, the, uh, I, I'm Evelyn Geiser. I'm the Barley Chair of Everglades Research. And um, I've been working at FIU on Everglades issues for 21 years or something. And uh, with a whole bunch of faculty who have been working really hard on um, informing Everglades restoration and the whole process. And um, when I first started here, we were putting together um, those recommendations into, into what um, solidified into the comprehensive Everglades restoration plan. Um, in that many years, we've been seeing a few pieces of that program being implemented, but it's uh, nowhere near the uh, system-wide scale of um, restoring not only freshwater flows, but the quality of the water um, as we had anticipated. And, um, you know, digging into this, we've got uh, social scientists working on, on this issue as well um, to try to kind of dissect um, why. And uh, there's so many different special interests and so many different um, stakeholders involved that we often get stuck in kind of a quagmire. Um, there is one really important piece of legislation moving through uh, to create a great big reservoir in um, the Everglades agricultural area. Um, where we can move water out of the lake and store it, that is really, really important. And it's exciting to know that this uh, step is, is moving forward, is, um, you know, moving forward through the decision-making process now. Um, however, we still have a lot of poor quality water entering into our um, upper Everglades ecosystem. Um, the area, the... Um, water flows into Lake Okeechobee are still uh, very poorly monitored and understood. And um, even the monitoring that we do have um, shows that we're really exceeding the standards for the state, um, yet not complying to those standards. That is a problem. Um, and so we need, what we need is more land to clean this water. Um, we have been working on how much land, and we have recommendations out there to um, the state and uh, our Congress, to our federal um, Congress, to uh, um, describe why and how uh, that land would help clean this water so that the water moving out of the lake and, and hopefully eventually into the Everglades is clean and um, also not routed directly into our coastlines and causing these kinds of harmful algal blooms. And I think that just to, to follow up on that, I mean, this is where the water quality network, monitoring network was there and has been scaled back. We know where we need to be monitoring. We just need to put the resources in place because that's not just what's going on now. It can then identify where nutrients are coming in. Their, rest, their small scale restoration, have you heard about the marshes that would clean the nutrients out before they get into the bay. So there's a whole network of solutions that we do know and we just have to kind of have the, the willpower to do it. And I think that's where you've got the science but you need the business community, the tourism, to put the money behind the prevention, not just once it's happened, how do we respond? So, um, you know, I believe it was mom that said an ounce of prevention is worth <laughs> a few kilos of, of cure. Um, so I, I think that we, we need to do that. Um, and we have some questions from social media. That oh, yeah. So anyone online, at FIU Case, tweet us your questions. So we have a question from Facebook from Angie Gutierrez. She says, what are the health side effects we should be aware of? People I know are experiencing long-lasting coughs and chest pains. So I actually think that, that humans are the most sensitive instrument that we have for detecting red tides because people start feeling these respiratory effects um, pretty early when cell counts are, are pretty low. Um, so they, they experience a, a throat irritation, sneezing, coughing, burning eyes. Um, I advise people, if you, if you start feeling that, you shouldn't be there, right, unless you absolutely have to be there, right? Maybe you're a lifeguard, you have to work on the beach. Yeah, so I, I would just follow up uh, that up by saying that we also have to think about susceptible populations. Uh, people that have asthma, for example, people that have immune deficiencies, uh, children, uh, the elderly, all of these individuals, uh, 
are more susceptible than a, you know, mic type. Um, so we, we do have to think about, uh, you know, the, the susceptible uh, individuals in our communities. They're, they're definitely more sensitive. Excellent. And one other one that's, that's come in, and then we're going to uh, get the microphone up here. Um, what's the effect going to be of the hurricane on, you know, moving up through the Gulf? Um, is this going to affect the effects on people or how long the red tide is going to be present on the West Coast? Well, in the past, that it has actually happened that, you know, hurricanes, I think it was Andrew back then, that, you know, moved like a, a, an incoming patch of, of one of these episodes up north. Obviously, it's not just like the, 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 the sw it's not only the direction of the current that is going to cause the hurricane, but also the, the swell that is going to cause, the increase in water level. So that obviously is going to move water into the land. And eventually, that could be as well be one of the, of the reasons why an event such as this one or in the future could be actually um, um, like, uh, exacerbated by the effect of the hurricane. Any effects on the aerosols or the toxins released by? So, so I'm, I'm not a marine biologist, but it's my understanding, and they, my colleagues here can correct me, is that forces like, you know, waves and hurricanes actually disrupt these organisms and release the toxins. So there's potential for a greater percentage uh, of the toxin to be released under this type of hurricane conditions. And then the, the, the follow-up to that is any... Any implication of red tide and king tides happening at the same time with king tides happening this week? Yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely possible that being Everybody we have Everybody looks at the ceiling <laughs> and down. <laughs> um, it's, it's definitely possible with, with, the, with the higher tides that uh, greater volumes of saltier water could move further towards land. So that would move some of these blooms further towards land. My, let me let me make a comment uh, about your question about aerosols that I don't think we touched yet. So a lot of these toxins uh, are transported as aerosols that we can um, inhale. So uh, we do know that things that we uh, breathe in can actually get directly to the brain. So there there, there are more than one way that these neurotoxicants can get into the central nervous system. One is because they're lipophilic, and that gives them the property to go through the capillaries and get to the brain. But we know that many chemicals can actually get through the brain via the olfactory uh, nerve. So this is a, 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 an area that we really have zero information as in regards to the potential, although the animal studies that have suggest, that have, where they have exposed into aerosols and, and they have found it in the brain. So it's clearly one way that, that this toxin can get into the central nervous system. Great, thank you. We had a question here on the end from this gentleman. Just wait for the microphone and tell us who you are, please. I'm Gary Gromet, and uh, I'm a, a gardener, basically. Has there any been any research on using fungus to ameliorate the poisons of these uh, red tide, the toxins? Fungus has seemed to, uh, they eat stuff and they're being used like it to, when there's no energy, they mutate. So they, when they couldn't have find a food, force, a food source at Chernobyl, they started eating radiation. Is there any research being done by FIU to use fungus of some sort to eat the red tide, the blue-green algae, and other eutrophications? I, I can uh, partially address that. There have been some studies looking for bacteria that will metabolize the toxin or use it as a carbon source. Mm. Um, they, they, very few bacteria can, can decompose this toxin. Um, chemically, uh, people have looked at using ozone to decompose the toxin, and actually Moat Marine Lab is, is working on this right now. Uh, this was actually tested in the St. Lucie estuary, the, the ozonolysis. Um, it, it was not that successful, and uh, partially because of the density of that blue-green algae bloom, right? Uh, so ozone will react with almost anything, and if your toxin is there in parts per billion, but all the other organic matter is there in parts per thousand, it basically eats up all of the ozone. Um, it also, ozone also does not react with the brevitoxin, so it's not going to decompose it. 
Um, I think maybe their objective was to kill the microorganism, which probably, which certainly could work. Um, but this, this compound is very stable and very persistent, or these compounds. Okay, so I've got another one coming in uh, over the airwaves for uh, Dr. Lesby. Are, is the tourism industry accounting for the potential effects of uh, the red tide in their workers, or are they taking steps you know, in the affected areas to, to help their workers? Um, I don't know of any efforts to help workers directly. I do know that there's, um, similar to the business industry, there's mini grants for impacted destinations to particularly address this issue of rebranding, putting the information out, um, changing your marketing efforts, um, you know, from beach to other more cultural um, events happening. So those are the things that are going on, which then in turn, of course, will impact the workers because it will allow them to actually keep their jobs. <laughs> I can just add um, as well that one of my colleagues was actually taking his wedding photos this weekend up in uh, Palm Beach. And um, he has asthma, so he was very sensitive to this, but he did notice on the beach that some of the lifeguards did have uh, masks on and things like that. And I know some of the folks that are kind of closer to the beach, I know that they've been taking those type of precautions. Great. Thank you. And uh, we'll uh, come up and across this row and then back down. So where'd the microphone okay, go? Just, I was to get your okay. So we have another question from Facebook from Deborah Massiel. She's asking, how far inland do you have to be to avoid these toxins? So on the West Coast, uh, they have uh, observed the toxins being carried as far as two miles inland. So the, the water, the waves, the beaches on the West Coast are much more calm than they are here. I think we have the potential to have those toxins traveling further here on the East Coast, but I don't know of any studies that have been, uh, been done. That's right. Mm -hmm. Great. Dr. Forkren, over your left shoulder. Thank you. If, if I can um, get you guys to comment again about this generalization effect. So Florida, uh, our tourism industry is based on the reputation of Florida. Mm -hmm. And we already have heard stories about how what's um, bad news about one part of Florida affects tourism all over the state. And, and so I would like to flip that observation on its head to say that because bad news about Florida has uh, negative impacts across the state, that's a reason for us in Miami-Dade County to be really worried about the Peace River on the West Coast, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so we need to be citizens of the state that has the reputation and be just as worried about West Coast environmental problems as we are East Coast environmental problems. Mm -hmm. um. Well, I guess I would agree with you um, <laughs> that basically it's marketed as Florida beaches. Um, and so people, people for, and especially internationally, might not know the difference between Palm Beach or the West Coast or Miami Beach or Key Biscayne. So I, I definitely agree with you that in that. And um, I know that's why the state of Florida is putting a lot of resources behind this for the impacted areas. Um, I know that they are being proactive in terms of when they're doing additional tests to find counties like Miami-Dade or Broward and things like that. They're adding them to executive order so that they can kind of start ramping up potential resources and things like that. Um, but I know that I, I would agree with you, basically. You know, it's, it's a coordinated marketing campaign. You know, we're all in it together. Um, and so it's one of those things that we just have to get, as the panel's kind of reiterating, we need to get out the right information, um, you know, basically the specific information on which beaches are impacted. Um, but I know that a lot of the reporting, you know, the beaches were reopened in here in Miami-Dade this weekend. You know, they had advisories on it. Um, but basically, the beaches re reopened. I understand some of the other beaches, um, they, are re they are open with advisories. Um, so I think that those, that's also something to get the word out on. They're not all closed with, you know, pe people with gas masks and, like, red tape everywhere and stuff like that. Um, but there are advisories for folks, as they mentioned, that have sensitive health conditions and things like that. So I'm, I'll, I'm sorry. No, no, I just quickly follow up on that. Um, so, again, timely, credible, and accurate information. So... When they let me out, I take vacation once in a while, and this summer I was in Siesta Key for a week. It turned out that that week uh, we didn't have red tide. The previous week we did, and the week after. But you know, at the beach I would talk to people, and they they have no idea. This is uh, here's red tide, and they, it's the entire state of Florida, and that's why I mentioned earlier that timely, credible, and accurate information is extremely important uh, to tell the visitors that are coming uh, to our state. And just to follow up on that, what we do know is that tourists don't stop traveling. 
they'll just go somewhere else. Yeah. Um, and I think that's the key information with this generalization effect is that um, we can still keep them here if we have that information out where they can go or not or where it's safer. And so just to follow up on that, are you seeing any coordination among some of the uh, industries in impacted areas working with areas that are less impacted for the handoff, or how is that coordination happening? I mean, ironically, we actually benefited from the red tide on the West Coast because more people were coming to the East Coast um, before this happened. So uh, even within the state of Florida, there's some um, disparities of, of that. And is that ever coordinated where it's a, you know, help and reciprocal relationship, or is it more opportunistic? <laughs> uh, well... I would say I don't know of any reciprocal real relationships, but I do know that they're working with the locals when the tourists stay out to keep locals coming and spending more. So, Yeah, I know I would concur on that. Basically, you'll see a lot of this. Like, an example is uh, Zika. You know, folks, the international perception on Miami-Dade, you know, that Zika got out. Um, you know, we did see a slowdown in international tourists coming in and tourists from around the country. You did have a lot of businesses that focused more on getting that local traffic, that local tourism. You know, they had like buy Winwood days, you know, eat it in Winwood, things like that. Those were things that we helped on as well. I mean, and you also look at the biggest, one of the largest companies in the state in terms of uh, Disney. You know, Disney will do a lot of international marketing and things like that. They do have parts of the year where they focus more on like local tourists and getting in. And a lot of the stuff we do is try to help some of those businesses come up with those strategies, you know, in terms of attracting more local business, you know, doing different campaigns. Um, there's a lot of folks that um, like some of the beaches, I mean, some of the hotels in Key Biscayne, they actually came up with a pretty good idea that's like a black card. Um, you would think like American Express or something like that, but it's actually a black card for locals where you can get discounted valet parking, discounted at the restaurant, discounted at the resort. Um, so you can actually go over there and get a break on um, eating at some of those nicer hotels. Um, and so I know that's a lot of businesses, they'll do stuff like that to bring in more locals. Great, we got someone with the microphone right now. So my question is more for Chema and Tom, um, and likely Mike. Uh, so we've seen a lot of die off across different trophic levels, um, and just from, mainly from fish and dolphins and, and manatees are what we see, but there's a lot of underlying impacts uh, within the coral reefs um, and, and in breeding grounds. So what does, that, what does our fishery look like in the future as a result of these massive die offs? And are there any impacts to fisheries management in terms of catch limits that will be impacted as a result? Thank you. Well, uh, obviously, as, as, you will, as, you, as you said, I mean, we are observing a lot of mortalities in those like higher stances of the, of the trophic change because, well, basically, as, as Dr. Ryan said, I mean, we have like those small little mollusks or shrimps that are gonna be really resilient to the effects of those toxins. However, that thing is going to be bioamplified through trophic change. And that is gonna be affecting more and more and more uh, these organisms for the obvious reasons. I mean, we have the toxins, we have the effect at the genetic level, and obviously, uh, even at the level of coral reefs, not directly because of the effect of this toxin, but because of the proliferation of other algae, macroalgae that are going to be linked also to the discharge of these nutrients, is something that is definitely going to affect, like, uh, the uh, critical defining ecosystems that we have here in South Florida. Coral reefs, mangrove forests, those two are basically like, you know, the cradles of diversity worldwide. And obviously those are going to be affected and also including at the level of fisheries as well. So again, not me, not being, being a, a, a fisheries management person, I mean, but I can see how is that going to actually impact like, the diversity that we're gonna have there and obviously like the recreational fishing. Tom, wanna to expand on that? I'm just thinking about what you know, what I see on the on the West Coast. I mean, it, it's phenomenal. You know, all the large amounts of, uh, of of fish of all different trophic levels dying, and you know that definitely has to have a have an effect that's going to be felt years years down the road. You know, because you know the life the life cycle, the lifespan of, of those fish is so is so long. For so yeah, absolutely. I, I'm sorry, I, I don't have any uh, insight to tell you what some of those effects may be, but. They're going to be uh, going on for a few years, even after these uh, major blooms. And I think just to follow up on that before we get to your question, sir, is uh, 
from Facebook, which is how do we know seafood is safe from uh, coming from Florida waters? So obviously, I think this is a, a result of you know the concern in the reporting. So, uh, Dr. Ryan. So, as far as uh, shellfish, commercial shellfish, uh, the state does a really good job of monitoring those commercial shellfish beds. Very few cases of NSP, neurotoxic shellfish poisoning, have been reported. Um, so we aren't like uh, dolphins. We don't eat the whole fish, right? We eat the, the mussel. And in fish, uh, the toxins tend to be more concentrated in the, the organs. Um, having said that, I still probably wouldn't eat fish during, that I've caught during a red tide. But in terms of the, the fish that ends up in, mm -hmm. in Publix or uh, the supermarket, that has been tested, so that would be safe. That fish has not been tested. Okay. We, so. the, the state tests shellfish. Right. I know of no organization that tests fish. And so is there, is there anything for consumers to worry about with that, mm -hmm. that fish that's making it into stores? Uh, maybe. Um, there was a case uh, several years ago um, where a commercial fishing boat scooped up a bunch of dead and dying fish and sold the fish, and uh, a lot of people got sick. That was uh, on the, in the Gulf of Mexico that happened. So it's, it's pretty rare because, okay. because we eat the mussel and the toxin doesn't concentrate in the mussel, but it's, it has happened. Excellent. Uh, Dean Guillarte, any follow-up? I, I think the only thing that I would say is that, um, coming back to my previous statement, is that we do know the amount of the toxin that produce acute effects. But if there are lower levels, what are the long-term effects? We have no clue, no idea. Excellent, and then uh, we had a question down front. Uh, my name is Alain Duran, I'm a postdoctoral researcher here at FIU. I just wanna follow up on your comment, which is that some of the commercial species that we have here in South Florida, I'm talking about the lobsters, the snappers, they actually spend quite time in these three ecosystems. And there are two factors that actually kind of call my attention. One mentioned by Dr. Rain, these toxins could be there for eight months in the sediments, in part of the seagrass beds. They, they are lipophilic, so they could, could uh, bioaccumulate. So we could be, um, we could predict that maybe actually some long-term impacts on the fisheries if there is a bioaccumulation on some of these commercial species. Talking about the uh, lobsters, I'm talking about these snappers that do not feed straight on those sediment, um, on those sediment grains, but also feed on to this toxin is going to be incorporated in the uh, trophic web and then could be bioaccumulated maybe in two or three years if this actually is a perfect uh, recipe. So we have uh, warm water, we have increase in nutrients. We need to keep eyes on those because obviously we might be presenting a further problem that might be caused by what we are actually seeing today. I think that to follow up a little like quick on that is that I agree with you Alan. I mean I think it's, it's not just like uh, by looking at that, but I think that precisely like combining the water monitoring, which I think is the most important thing we should do, combining that with the actual impact on, on marine life, it's what's going to actually help us create that map of, of effects that is going to eventually inform restoration or management or, or modeling that we can actually apply in order to first see like what's going to happen in the future and how can we like use that information to ameliorate those effects. Okay, one more from social, then I'm going to come to you. So, uh, someone concerned about the keys. Their question, though, is, uh, you know, why is it less common to find this in the keys? I mean, you, you know, you found this organism, not one that's linked to human effects, but you know, the keys is generally not an area where you think of red tide. Why is that? I don't exactly know, but let me tell you a little bit about how you know, this uh, Corona brevis gets over here to the East Coast. It often gets entrained in the loop current and then goes all the way towards the uh, Tortugas and the Marquesas, comes through, gets in the Straits of Florida, and then shoots up the East Coast. And it's, not, it's no surprise that you know, the, the, where this was recently found, first time on the East Coast, was off of Palm Beach, because that's where the Gulf Stream comes closest in. You get a little eddy, w w w which kicks off there, and, and it has a high likelihood of uh, coming in over there. So you know, why, not, why not the Keys? I, 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 I'm sorry, I, I really can't explain that. You know, it's possible that it, uh, you know, the G Gulf Stream is pretty quick down there. It, you know, it maybe gets right out there and shoots up there pretty quickly. Uh, maybe some of these eddies 
uh, don't form as much as they do further up the coast, but uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I really don't have an answer to that. But we've heard a lot about the loop current between the oil spill and this, and so I think, again, that shows how connected the system is from even the northern Gulf of Mexico all the way up uh, the east coast. So uh, we have another question here down front. Yes. Um, Susan Jacobson from the Department of Journalism. So I'm going to ask you a question that I think you've answered, but I'm going to form the question so that the answer is in the form of a sound bite. So we have an election coming up in 30 days. If you could give two recommendations to either the people running for governor or for a commissioner of agriculture about how to handle red tide, what would it be? Thank you. I'd like to say stop ignoring the problem, right? We've ignored this issue until it's become an, an emergency, and we just can't ignore it anymore. Listen to the science. Mm -hmm. Sorry? Huh. Well, I mean, I think this is a very complex issue. It's not just about scientists. It's not just about policymakers. It's not just about the government. I think um, businesses should be involved. Businesses should be here because they're affected, but the OSHA should be part of the solution, in my opinion. So it's a system problem. It's not one or two. It, 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 it's, you, you tweak here, and it's going to affect over there. So it's a much broader uh, conversation than even what we're having here today, in my opinion. Sure. Those are all part of it. You may ask for a sound bite. Uh, how about um, no to partisan bickering, yes to algae? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, I mean, all, all jokes aside, I think Dr. Geyser hit on it earlier. I mean, we, we have a lot of these solutions in place to get the nutrients out of the water. And um, it's been decades since those were developed. And it's stick to the plan. I mean, the, the plan is there. And we just got to get it done. Um, and to follow up on that, I think that there's always this argument that, oh, agriculture is big business, but I think it makes economic sense, even more economic sense, to invest now and make those changes. So, so actually, I have a question. And, you know, hey, wait, no, that's not allowed. Oh, okay. No, just kidding. Go ahead. <laughs> we, we, in the next row. No, go ahead with your question. No, I, I've been in the state of Florida for three years, even though I used to be here many years ago. And the question is, if we do have these solutions, what is it stopping from implementing them? I, I don't know. And you obviously had over 20 years of experience in trying to provide a solution, implement them, and it hasn't happened. So what, what is a bottleneck? Yeah, it's um, a nest of, oh, I don't know. Um, I, it's mainly that uh, 20 years ago, this was an $8 billion plan. Every year, the cost of every piece of it becomes uh, much greater. There's an agreement between the state and federal governments to uh, cost share every single piece of, um, of the Everglades Restoration Program, and there's often disagreements about what um, should come first. Um, there is new knowledge um, that we gain, and um, a history of nutrient loading into Lake Okeechobee yeah. is biting us in the buns and in ways that um, I, I think we probably would have predicted, but now we're seeing it, and the, the, so the problems are a lot worse now as a result of waiting. So um, yeah. the point that uh, every, every dollar spent now is much more like 40 times gained in the future, which is some estimates that have been done for the sea level problem um, is very true. So it's only going to cost us more the longer we may wait. Yeah. Um, but but you know, with limited budgets and so many different concerns that end up getting uh, the majority of the attention, it often has to come to something like the crisis that we're seeing now um, before a lot of our politicians jump on board. We are seeing that now, but it it took you know where we are. And you mentioned interest groups. Mm -hmm. Can you speak to that effect? Um, yeah, well, I don't know if I want to get into the details of it. it, it there's just so many different... That'll be our next different... panel on yeah. Everglades restoration. <laughs> exactly. It'll be the, the next panel. We can take two hours on yeah, that. Yeah. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Can I comment on something? Um, tourism, you know, 
the uh, largest in industry in the state at 11 billion. Why, why does it seem that the, uh, in, in relation to the environmental issues, uh, that agriculture interests pull so much more weight than tourism? That is a really good question because it is our number one industry and that's why I mentioned it makes economic sense for us to make those changes. I, I agree yeah. with you. Yeah, absolutely. I have an answer to that. Okay. <laughs> good. <laughs> well, we're sitting on the environmental regulatory board of the governor. I mean, that's who's appointed to recommend what's... Well, it know, seems like, you know, the, the, the tourism the needs to develop a stronger environmental lobby. Excellent. I think we had a uh, question in the back still. Excellent. <laughs> Hi, my name is Anna Fernandez de Castro, and I'm a public health student in the master's program. And my question is, um, how good is the communication and cooperation um, amongst all these different disciplines um, throughout, you know, different parts of the state. Like, for example, like um, during like um, a red tide crisis, you know, like um, on the East Coast, is the East Coast communicating and cooperating well with the West Coast um, to come up with um, solutions to the problem? I don't have a, the answer, but it's great to see a public health student here. <laughs> Now that is a cheap punt. <laughs> I, I don't have an answer either, but I guess that when it comes to science, for instance, for me, it's like much easier to get a hold of what's going on precisely because I'm, of, you know, I'm going to be in touch with my colleagues, right? I don't know if that actually filters to other uh, kind of, of uh, agents participating in this process, namely economic or tourism, but <clears throat> I mean, obviously, I, I think it would be great if we are able to just branch out in a, in a way that is more consistent. So I'll just, I'll give you a thought. I mean, I think scientists need to be more proactive. I think besides doing the science, we need to communicate it. And, you know, with, with uh, government, with policymakers. Um, so it, one potential uh, solution is for us that do the science to really be more proactive in, in policy in, with government, with business. Uh, and oftentimes we don't do that. Excellent. I think we've got time for, let's do one last question right here. Hi, my name is Joshua Lindenfelser. I'm a marine biology undergraduate student. I just wanted to ask, um, how long would the naturally occurring red tide last around 50 years ago? And how long is this specific red tide expected to last? How long is this one on the east and west coast? Well, uh, based on what we know now about the differences of temperature and population in South Florida, both in east and west coast, I mean, west coast, it wouldn't even be like an issue, I think. I mean, you won't have, you wouldn't have a, a, a red tide episode in the east coast uh, 50 years ago. That's what I would say. Now, in the West Coast, obviously, my, my take is that the, the duration of, of this episode would be much less, precisely because of less population, less development, coastal areas, and obviously because of the differences in the uh, water surface temperature. So that is my opinion. Uh, so yeah, the, the West Coast bloom, you know, started, uh, it's almost a year old or is a year old, so that's a very long time. It's, you know, it went through all four <coughs> seasons. Uh, now we're here, we're about a week and a half into the, into the East Coast bloom. Um, obviously, we're hopeful that, you know, the, the, the cooler temperatures as we, as we move, into the, uh, move into the winter may keep it from developing further. But honestly, I, don't, I think that's just a guess. Yeah, but, you know, we are, we are heading towards a scenario in which we are probably going to be living one way or the other under a constant mm -hmm. harmful algal bloom. So the, the, I believe the longest bloom on record was 2005, and that lasted for 18 months. Excellent. Well, um, I want to thank everybody for being here. I think that, and especially the panel, uh, for a really uh, wonderful insights and, and for a really really great discussion. I mean, there, there's no question there's a lot more to learn and a lot more to do. I mean, we heard the importance for uh, re-implementing our monitoring stations. Um, if anyone's interested, we actually just put a buoy off Hallover Inlet. 
Um, and if you go to news.fiu.edu, there's a story that just went up, and you can watch real-time data off that buoy uh, to look at water quality. But we obviously need to increase that. We've got to implement the nutrient solutions that are already there, and we've got a lot to do on the communications front to get it right and to get it at a fine scale where people can use it and businesses are not hurt um, in areas that don't have issues. And uh, it also sounds to me like there's a real need to get more groups together right now from business, tourism, science, and uh, the communication professionals to make sure we get this right, get it spread out, and implement, develop new solutions and implement, uh, implement the ones we know we need to. So uh, thank you very much for being here. Um, it's uh, been a pleasure to bring this to you. And uh, one last thank you to our panel. Have a great day. <laughs>